All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Welcome to our Milestone 2 uh, Town Hall webcast. You might have heard that this weekend is planned to be a big weekend for Fiscal. We're hoping to go live. We will get our final decision shortly. So uh, we set this Town Hall webcast up as an additional opportunity to demo some of the changes that are occurring for your department and for us to ask or answer any questions you might ask. So I'd like to let the audience know to ask questions using the Q&A, and we will capture all the questions there. We'll try to do our best today to answer some of the questions. We have some of our SMEs off screen, um, and we will take away any questions we're unable to give you sufficient answers for today, and we'll get back to you through the same ML box as soon as we can. All right, so my name is Ronald Cortez. I'm sitting here with my colleague, uh, Yassar DeBoer and Lynette Andres from STO and SCO. And we'll begin walking through a very short presentation. So, you have a question? Will the PowerPoint slides be available for download? Uh, currently, we've got a very light amount of presentation for you, but we will have the overall demo video available for you guys to review. Um, we can discuss later about having the presentation available as well if uh, the audience finds it helpful. So our agenda today is we wanted to give you a quick status update on what's going on with the SEO STO release, uh, then just give you a quick review of the key changes before we go into our demo, and then overall process reminders of things that you should be doing today in Fiscal to be successful as a Fiscal department. We'll get into our demo, or we'll demo the new functionality for deposit lists and we'll go over how you should do your EFITS remittance to the FISCAL. And finally, we'll go over a few cutover logistics. When the no-go decision is made, you'll receive a communication outlining uh, the specifics of it, so there's no need for you guys to note or write that down. You'll see, uh, you'll see the official information um, shortly. And then we'll have just a quickly how to access some of the additional resources that we have on the new FISCAL website. So for a release update, you have our no-go, go decision. It's looking very positive for tomorrow, um, but anything can change. And then we'll have that cutover communication after. We have this town hall webcast is a new venue we're trying for the SEO SEO release as a way to help you departments get your impact effectively. Um, we can, if this is a successful event, we're planning on having another uh, town hall regardless uh, the week after go live to support any questions that might come in um, in a more interactive fashion. And uh, we can continue doing these types of events um, based on the feedback we get from departments. So we always appreciate feedback from departments. Just a reminder, you know, we've got most departments have at least one deposit the processor role uh, assigned. However, there are a few departments that have yet to get any deposit slip processor roles. So if you feel like you are somebody at a department or if you're a department that hasn't um, had their data sign any users through the ISS, the last day to do so before the cutoff, make sure you have a day of uh, a day one user so that your cash can come through is going to be this Friday. Um, you will have access to, act, to assign roles through ISS after go live. However, there's a good opportunity there that there might be some sort of delays. And when it comes to cash, that's not something we really we want you guys to have to deal with as departments. All right, so this is uh, the department change road roadmap that we presented during the impact or department change impact workshop. Um, kind of gone through some of the last minute reminders there. You know, we're pretty close to the go live. Uh, any, you know, you've seen some of the activities that we've done for departments to make sure departments are aware of impacts. There are several more milestones and releases coming up for the SEO SEO release over the next year. Uh, so any feedback you can give us overall, we'd appreciate. Um, we've been doing our best to make sure that departments are aware and understand and are um, willing to adopt these new changes as we go forward. So that's a specific importance for this release because we have some, some control agencies coming on with uh, big cash impacts. So quickly going into here, just a quick review of some of the changes we released infographic earlier um, this year. 
uh, a few weeks ago. And then you'll see here that the big things for you to remember are STO deposit splits are now in Fiscal. So this means that if you previously sent manual deposit splits to STO, you should be doing that uh, yourself now. So that means if you have field offices, they should be sent into some sort of department HQ or headquarters uh, for your department to manually enter those into Fiscal. Um, if you use EDF today, same people who use EDF today should probably be or will be using Fiscal tomorrow as EDF actors will be going away. Um, just a reminder, departments should take their deposits to the banks in a timely manner from SEO. Then we go into agency remittances. These are your TC47 remittances. This is how you remit your cash after you've uh, done a deposit slip. These will now be done in Fiscal. Question? DIR has been delayed until November release with five other agencies. Does this information apply to us now or after we go live in November? When will the November dates be communicated to us? Thanks. Um, I'm not aware of any November release departments. Uh, from my understanding, all departments should be live um, besides CAL FIRE this, with our release here in October this weekend. Uh, all departments should be transacting. And then we've heard CAL FIRE is a little bit more delayed, and they should continue with their processes as is, continue to use EDF, and continue to use EFITS. Both EDF and EFITS will be available for non-fiscal departments um, until, you know, there's after there's some stability for fiscal. With this release, there might be some discussions to bring the non-fiscal departments onto fiscal for use as well. And then I think that we have Bobby from STO who would like to offer a little bit more information. Good morning. Good morning. I was aware that um, DIR was going to DIR was going to be using INF AR zero zero one instead of eighteen, but I was not aware that they were not going live until November. Okay. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue from now. So uh, your EFITS transactions that you currently do with EFITS, those are going to be moving into Fiscal. We'll provide you a demo shortly of how that's going to look uh, to help you guys with any confusion you might have. But uh, overall, what this means is that Fiscal is just replacing EFITS. You'll still have read-only access to it, um, just like you'll still have read-only access for EDF. Uh, you just won't be able or shouldn't be, able to be transacting in EFITS any longer um, after this weekend. And the other part of that is your TC38 and 35 corrections. If you have any corrections to any of your accounts, you'll be using Fiscal for those corrections as well. Um, those are going to be those are going to be interfaced and uh, workload to SEO for approval. And you'll see here that there's a variety of types of transactions that are going to go for approval. We've actually got a job aid on the Fiscal website. Uh, or will be available on the Fiscal website, and you guys should see some communication soon um, to help you guys more about uh, understand what will work well and what will not work well. And then finally, your direct payments to the state treasury. Um, this is typically your federal funds. If you have some federal funds coming in, uh, those are called TC30s by the SEO and SEO. Those will continue as as is. The big difference for you is that those that information will now be interfaced into Fiscal, uh, and it will be available for you guys to make corrections on, the same way you can make corrections on any other account. Okay, so are any questions for, are we have some questions? I still have last month's EFIT. Can I still EFIT? What is the cutoff date? We'll get into some more specifics about EFIT. Uh, for our cutover. We've got a section on that a little bit later in the presentation. All right. Any more questions? Okay, so we've got some process reminders. There's two big things that departments should be keep in mind. There's going to be the single payment vouchers and the ORFA punishment. Um, these are all in AP. 
So we do not want departments to issue ORF advances via single payment voucher, single pay supplier. Uh, single pay vouchers are not replenished in fiscal. ORF advances to regular vendors are submitted via regular voucher to the supplier that has an SCD 204 on file. Uh, please remember that. And then for ORF replenishments, uh, for over remitted ORF replenishments, to create a regular voucher, you have three options for what you can do. I think you may only actually have two options. Um, you can, if you have an over remit or replenishment, you should do one, you can create a regular voucher payable to the department for the over remitted amount. And then once the warrant is issued, you can deposit that back into your CTS account. And then two is you can submit a paper replenishment claim schedule for the over remitted amount. And then Lynette, correct me if I'm wrong, are they still able to uh, short the following deposit in the amount over remitted? If it's applicable, they still can. I don't know if I uh, guess for that, but when that has confirmed if it's applicable, you still can. So the third option then would be to short the following deposit in the over minute amount. Questions? Two online. Would you say that EDF site is going away tomorrow? If it goes live Monday, we still need EDF through the end of the week. Um, you know, I apologize if I misspoke. Uh, the EDF and EFITs will be available until the end of this week. Um, we'll get more into the specifics of when they're not going to be available. Um, but the basic idea is that you will stop using your current processes this week and you will be using those same processes in fiscal next week, you know, at the end of this week. We've been delayed until November. What do we do, what do we need to do to request to continue to use EDF until we can use in INFAR018? Um, which department may I ask is this? Water boards? Okay, what, water boards has been identified as not going live until November. So you will continue to have access to EDF. Okay. Any other questions around the process reminders? All right. So now we're going to go ahead and get started with our demo. Uh, we'll start with the full-on process with CSAR. All right, good morning. So this time next week, this is how we will be doing business uh, for depositing the, your fund. Uh, first, let's start with navigation. So to start with, we go to main menu, account receivable, payments, online payments, and deposit slip entry. That would lead you to a search page. It has many variables by which you could search historical deposits or older deposits. You could uh, search by deposit type, CTS account, date, uh, deposit slip status, etc. But to get into the entry slip, we go to add a new value. Think of it as a add a new deposit. And for deposit type, you could click, for the beginning, you could click the magnifying, magnifying glass, and that would give you a different type of deposit. So for most of you, gonna be, or the most common type here, I could point the manual, the standard, and the remote. To make things easier, you see many supplemental, like supplemental for uh, manual, supplemental for standard deposit, etc. What these are usually for understated deposits. Let's say you made a deposit uh, of $10,000 worth of checks, but you only entered 900. That means you will only get credit for one um, for $900. To 
bridge that gap, you will need to go back to supplemental and claim your uh, $100 that you did not claim before. And uh, for now, let's, uh, you, by the way, you do have uh, on the job aid that we're releasing for this, uh, for deposit slip processing. In the back, there's a table that explains what each one of these types are and uh, uh, what, is, uh, what it is used for. So for now, let's just uh, do a demo uh, using the standard type. So I could just select it from here, or I could simply, in the future, you could just type S, and you don't have to go through that menu. You press Add, and voila. Now, this one is, uh, should be very familiar to you, the end user of EDF. Uh, pretty much this one looks the same. You have your CTS bank account, your location. You have uh, a field for agency use, and this should have about uh, 254 characters that you, you could fill in there, and it will, you will have it printed on the deposit slips, uh, the deposit bank, and make sure it, as you notice, some of these fields have magnifying glass next to them. So for departments that have more than two, uh, one CTS account, they could click on that, and you could select a different uh, CTS account. So here I'm selecting a different one for now. Uh, likewise for depository bank. Now for deposit transport methods, you have uh, six, uh, six different types of uh, transport methods. Bank stamp is usually, and the, all those are explained, all, explained also in your job aid. So bank stamp uh, is pretty much when you go to the bank and you get a, a physical stamp on the deposit slip. Night deposit is uh, uh, likewise for late deposit at night. Electronic is using um, uh, uh, sort of uh, ICL uh, image or imaging cash letters. Uh, for carrier, that's when you send your deposit by way of carrier or by mail. For any other type of deposits, you could use others. I see there's, we have a question already. Is there a job aid number for this? If not, will it be available? Yes, it will be available. Uh, I don't know if it has been uh, uploaded yet. So with the transition to the new website, it might be a day or so delay to get it updated or uploaded. I believe the job aid number is 389. It is, as of this morning, not currently on the new website, but we'll, we're working with our team to make sure it is as soon as possible. And it's titled Create a Deposit Slip. Um, so likewise, you will notice like some of these uh, fields are dimmed. That is, you cannot actually use them. Like SEO override, that's one field that's used by the state treasurer's office only. Uh, for manual deposits, since we're working with standard deposit, they're dimmed. We cannot enter anything there. Uh, you have the fields here for the deposit uh, type of funds, currency, coins, checks, etc. So let's just demonstrate here. For example, now we're making a standard deposit. Uh, we go here. We make sure we have the proper CTS bank account, depository bank. We have the proper... Um, a transport method. We could use select any of these. And uh, for currency, for example, let's say we have a dollar, a check. We have, or for currency, actually, it's gonna have, not going to have decimal points, so it's going to be a hundred. Uh, whereas for checks, if I put a hundred, it's going to be one dollar because it accounts for decimal points. And for item count, that's for the number of checks you're depositing. And one thing here, the system does not actually add up all these deposits. You have to do it manually. So here we have $101. And again, account for the decimal points. Once you do that, you go into deposit date, Select, let's say, select uh, today's date. And once we're done with that, we go into status, deposit slip status. And here we turn it once we re review the information, make sure everything is in order, we change it into ready. And I see we have one more question. 
three questions. We have zero balance account. Can you show me how these are entered? How should these be matched since there's no deposit slip? We'll get into that in a minute. I'll uh, have Bobby assess us with that. But uh, we will do that. Different session? OK. So we will cover that in, under different sessions. So this one has to do directly with us with the deposit slip. Would you? Okay, so Lynette will help us. Yeah, uh, Lynette will help us covering that later on in this presentation. Are we able to demonstrate remote deposit? Sure, we can do that. Can we determine our own deposit number? Uh, for, uh, go ahead. Currently, all of the deposit numbers are starting with a one. For some reason, you need that deposit slip number to start with a particular um, deposit deposit slip number. You need to um, do a ticket through FSC, and FSC will contact STO, and STO will update those um, deposit slip numbers for you. Okay, one more question. Is there a special printer or ink required for printing deposit slips? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I'll get to you to it uh, in a minute. And I'll explain that. So from the uh, last thing we've done here is that we changed the deposit slip status from draft into ready. And at this point, I'd like to point out that some departments like to have uh, a reviewer or have uh, somebody enter all this information and save it as a draft. And from this point, they could just save it and leave. And then the manager or the reviewer could come back review the information, and then the manager would change that into ready and save. So once we click save, now you'll notice that um, the user is, can go on to create uh, a regular deposit. And also, now we're ready to print out the deposit slips. Now, if we click on the deposit slips, print deposit slip, Just wait a minute. Just being a little bit slow. And voila. So this is the information for our deposit slip, and we have a pop-up um, dialog box to print. But let's just review the information we just entered. Uh, as for the question about the different type of ink, yes, we will be using uh, microtone, uh, mic microtone, which is a magnetic ink for check reader, and those are really expensive. Uh, so we do recommend that you actually have a separate printer for that, because otherwise, any document you'll be printing is going to be using that ink. So we do, again, recommend that you use a different printer just for the deposit slip. Because what will that do is we'll make this code right here uh, readable by the banks. So you will have uh, on each page three slips, yes, three deposit slips, as you can see. Okay. And question. <clears throat> Can departments still use manual deposit slips? Uh, yeah, yes, they can. And uh, there's a process actually for that. OK. Bobby. For departments that want to use manual deposit slips, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, it will be a decision between Fiscal, the department, and STO. Um, we have made exceptions for departments who have remote offices or satellite offices who do not have access to the internet. But if you have access to the internet, we are expecting you to enter your deposit slips into Fiscal and not use the manual deposit slips. If, um, and, and just to make sure that I understand the question correctly, because there is a process here how to enter the manual deposit slips. So what we've used so far was a standard deposit slips. For manual, if let's say, and the difference between manual and standard, the manual means that you've already made the deposit, you have the slip, and you're just going to enter it to account for it in the system. 
And for that, it's a very similar procedure. Now, if you are one of those departments who have satellite and you used to have the STO film in your behalf, then what Bob, Bobby said is the way to go. You need to, it's a case-by-case -case sort of situation. So I could run, uh, uh, go quickly, actually, over a manual deposit to show you how we could do that. There's lots of questions. So let's go with the questions first, and we'll, we'll go to back to the manual deposit. Can you print the deposit slip in a hold status? Can it be saved in a hold status? While it's in hold? Yes. Once we have completed our deposit slip and delivered the deposit to the bank for processing, do we need to notify anyone at STO like, do, like we did in the old process, or do we do our own Department of Fiscal Programs division? If your deposit is over $100,000, you still need to contact, send an email to the STO Financial Services section. We requested starting deposit numbers for each of our regional office accounts. How do we verify that these have been processed in FISCAL? I have not received a request um, to have deposit numbers updated, so I need to know who you sent that to. Can we make changes after we've clicked Save? Um, for that, actually, you'd need to contact FSC. OK, as long as that deposit slip has not been processed by the, by the 3 o'clock batch process, you can make changes to the deposit slip. However, you need to put it in draft status, save, make your changes, and then put it back into ready status and click save. Are there print specifications, an example, scaling required by a bank? That's a takeaway question. We'll get back to you in that. If you would, uh, please uh, save that question in the inbox. Can we, continue, can we continue to use our regular deposit slips? OK, so if you're asking if you, continue to, if you can continue to use your manual deposit slips, once again, we recommend that you use the FISCAL system to create your deposit slips. However, in a case of emergency, or on, like, once again, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what your purpose is for using the manual deposit slips, we do not recommend you to continue using those manual deposit slips. Will our MICR line look like that, or is it just your test environment? Um, yeah, this is a test environment, so it'll look differently once we go live. It should look the same as it does in EDF and or on your manual deposit slip. Can the check printer be used for the deposit slips, or should it be a separate printer? Do you have a recommendation on type of printer? We don't have a recommendation on any type of printer. However, if, if your printer uses for checks uses micro toner, and if that's what you want to do is use that, that printer also that has Mikrotona for your deposit slips, that's a policy procedure or a department procedure. The currency printed out as $100 and not $1. So we need a decimal in the currency field then? No. The currency field does not recognize decimals because currency does not have cents. So if it's one dollar, you put one dollar in there, just one, just a one. If it's a hundred dollars, you put. I'm sorry. Yes, if it's a hundred dollars, you put a hundred. Can I continue the number from? Can I continue to use the number from EDF? If there's a specific reason that you want to use that number, you need to use that number. Yes. Uh, once again, you need to. Uh, create a ticket through FSC, and FSC will contact STO. Is a MICR printer required for electronic deposits? Yes. 
Can we use location code for our own use? Yes, any location codes that the departments currently have set up in EDF as of, I'm going to say, September 13th, have been already configured into the system. If you want to use a new deposit location, you would need to contact FSC and they would um, and do a ticket and they'll contact STO and STO will configure that location code into the system. You would need to give STO several business days in order to complete that process. For a previously submitted deposit that has not been keyed into FISCAL, how do we change the deposit number in FISCAL to match the deposit slip? You can't change the number in FISCAL to match the deposit slip. Once again, if, that's, if you request that the number be changed, um, it depends on what your reasoning is, what the purpose is behind um, updating that, that check number, I'm, I'm sorry, the deposit slip number, there are over close to 300 departments, and each department typically has more than, than one deposit type. So we're trying to limit um, updating deposit slip numbers unless there's a, a need, a really need basis. Was there a memo or anything, any information released regarding the printer requirements, including magnetic ink? Would you be able to please go over the printer information? This is the first time we're hearing about special printer toner. The special printer toner was made available during the Department Change Impact Workshop um, and for specific printer specifications. I think that we're having that as a takeaway. What is the difference between draft and on hold status? With the exception of supplementals, there is no difference to, between draft and hold status. Why do we need special toner to print out the deposit slips? We do remote deposits. If you do remote deposits, you do not take that deposit slip to the bank. Therefore, you do not have to print that remote deposit slip um, with microtone. How can we do a Bank of America wire deposit? Do you do those today? There have been several deposits entered this year. After what date will you require departments to enter manual checks into FISCAL? Enter manual checks? That would be a takeaway question. I believe for man entering manual checks, it would be an emergency basis as well as if you can't access the system. But we'll do a takeaway and get back. In regards to a previous question, starting deposit number, the email was sent to edfdeposits at treasurer.ca.gov. Okay, I'll look into that and get back to the agency. Where can we order this printer and how long will it take? Can you repeat the printer um, recommendation? We don't have a recommendation for printers, so you just go through um, however you, you place your orders for a printer. You would go through that process and what that would take, how long that would take, I don't know. Now, the, we, there is a grace period for instances such as this where the, um, and it will be only a 30-day grace period where the departments are waiting for their maker toner or, or waiting for their three-part perforated paper, whatever they're waiting for, in order to print that deposit slip, they can at, they can use the manual deposit slips. I want to stress: do not send those deposit slips to the treasurer's office after um, October fifth, Friday. We were unaware of the special toner. Is there another option? No, it should be maker toner. The most of the banks, when they run it through their scanner. Their reader, that's how it's read, is because it has maker toner. If they have to, if the bank has to enter that deposit slip number 
they charge the STO extra. Can we continue to use the perforated paper that we are currently used to print the deposit slips for from EDF? Yes. Is there a document or job aid that details ink type requirements for the deposit slips? We would need documented justification for the purchase. So we have our presentation that was released uh, earlier last month, the uh, Department of Change Impact Workshop. Uh, I think we can work with the STO to release something official requiring that. And then a quick question for you, Bobby. Is this microtoner requirement the same as EDF today? Yes. The departments using EDF are required to use microtoner. So the way this works is very similar to EDF, correct? Yes. That's correct. Currently in EDF, we do not scan a copy of the deposit slip to Bank of America. Why would we need to do that now? If you don't, if you're using electron, I'm sorry, remote or ICL electronic, if you don't scan that deposit slip number today, you just enter that deposit slip number, that process is going to remain the same. You don't have to print that deposit slip out. Do we submit a ticket to FSC if we want to continue using the manual slips? Our department does not have many deposits, so it does not make sense to purchase a microtoner printer. No, if you could present that question to CMO, and CMO will um, direct it to STO. So the CMO address is fiscal.cmo at fiscal.ca.gov. How do we request an exemption to use manual deposits? Repeat the question, please. How do we request an exemption to use manual deposits? Once we go live, you would contact the State Treasurer's Office Bank Reconciliation section. What reports can be run to show all deposits? Will these report that notate the different deposit types? We're working on that right now. How will EFT deposits be processed? EFT deposits will still be processed the same way they are today through your ZBA. I have been using EDF for quite a while, and will I have to access, will I have access to avoid a deposit? Okay, as, as of 2.30 on Friday, EDF will not be available to um, the fiscal departments. You will only have view access, so you need to void that deposit. If it's created in AD, EDF, you need to void that before 2.30. Um, once in fiscal, if you make a mistake, once again, as long as that deposit slip is in ready status, it has not been processed by the 3 o'clock batch process, you can delete it. On the bottom of the screen, there is a delete button that has been enabled. And after, three o'clock? And after 3 o'clock? After 3 o'clock, you cannot delete that deposit slip. That deposit slip has been processed. You would need to contact the State Treasurer's Office, Bank Reconciliation, so they can do an agency trust adjustment, ATA. And then how about voiding in fiscal? That's how you void in fiscal. So EDF, everything needs to be voided in EDF as of 2.30. When you go into fiscal, you can delete that transaction or that deposit slip as long as it has not been processed by the 3 o'clock batch process. Can we use the check printer to print deposit slips? And can you remind us one more time of the toner? So Bobby, this is the MICR toner, and from my understanding, this works with multiple printers, so it's specifically the toner type. And then Bobby has stated that STO does not have a printer recommendation, as long as you're using the MICR or MICR toner inside of the printer, it should work with these deposit slips. Is that correct, Bobby? 
Correct. If you are printing checks with Maker Toner currently, you can use the same printer, the same, if, if you'd like. That's a department policy. Will the questions and answers to the session be drafted and published? So this is a recorded meeting, and you'll be able to access the recording after the meeting as well. I'm from Cashier Unit, Department of Veteran Affairs. I would like to know what type deposit should be you, should be for us. For we have two kinds of deposits, one for general fund and the other for loan payments. So if you don't use um, EDF, I'm sorry, if you don't use remote or ICL and you are not a pre-sort, you would use a S, a standard deposit type. And so we're clear, these are deposit slips. So this is the deposit slip that you would print and you would take with you with the physical cash to the bank in some form. These are not the accounting deposits. The accounting deposits will go over later. Do we need to ask for a 30-day grace period in order to obtain the microtoner? No, it's automatic. All departments are being given a 30-day grace period. If we are doing remote deposits, is there no need for microtoner, correct? That's correct. If we are unable to run reports on Monday for our entire deposit, what are we supposed to do? We'll get back to them on that by the end of the week. In our department, we have to call up headquarters to void the deposit. Can the user void the deposit? Yes, the user can delete the deposit, which is actually voiding it once again, as long as that deposit slip is in ready status and has not been processed by the 3 o'clock business process, or batch process. Are the job aids with more details about the deposit entry process available? Uh, the job aid will be posted on the FISCAL website, and when it is, the department liaison should receive an email from the FISCAL CMO stating that it's available. The job aid number for deposit slips, when it is available, will be 389, and then you should be able to search on the new FISCAL website when it is available. How about the three-part paper for the printer? You still, if you're going to be taking that deposit to the bank, you would still need the three-part perforated paper. Do the deposit slips print on 8.5 by 11 an inch paper? Yes. If we are unable to run reports for our entire deposit starting Monday, what are we supposed to use to validate the entire deposit? Also, can EDD get a list of our deposit slip numbers and locations that FISCAL will be starting on with on Monday? As far as getting a list, if you want to go ahead and send a request to um, FSC, we can complete that list for you, but it may take several time, several days in order to compile that list. We will get out a listing of reports for departments that they can use for the deposit slips. For clarification, we have 30 days from October 5th, 2018 to gather all necessary means of printing deposit slips. During this time, we may continue with manual deposit slips, but no copy will be sent to STO, just entered to FISCAL, correct? That's correct. Will the material be dis being displayed during this training also be available online for review? How can we access the webinar? The material for this training will be posted online and we'll be communicating out to departments after the meeting uh, with a link to that as well. Okay, so that was the uh, last question. No, I, I actually have another question as well. Um, Bobby, you said stated several times that if the deposit slip was in ready status and by the 3 p.m. Uh, you could delete it. And I was wondering what would happen if you have it ready status saved and you click the create a regular deposit button, would you still be able to delete the deposit slip? No, you could not de delete the deposit slip at that time. So when you click the create regular deposit, that is finalizing that deposit slip as if it's running through the batch process. Is that correct? 
That's correct. If you click that, create um, AR deposit, you are creating a regular AR deposit. And if that regular AR deposit is either created by you clicking on that button or through the batch process, you cannot do that deposit. So. Question? Could you repeat again how the deposit number will be different in Cisco? Currently, all the deposit slip numbers start with a 1. We noticed that the deposit ID is auto-generated by FISCAL. Are we able to edit this number or create our own match the deposit slip number for reconciling purpose in the semi-manual reconciliation process? I would have to get back to you as far as if you can create that deposit slip ID before um, creating the deposit slip. But once that deposit ID has been created, you cannot change it. If you delete the deposit slip, will a new deposit number be generated for the updated one? Yes, if you deleted one, it will go to two. Your next deposit slip will be a two. Okay, so we really appreciate all the questions. This is uh, the main purpose of, the, of this webcast. Uh, this is the reason we scheduled it for two hours. So we should still have, we should still be on time for the webcast. Um, and we also appreciate all the participation. We know that some of the departments have had some of these questions, and uh, that's why we're giving you this opportunity to ask the question. So let me, uh, regarding the microtoner, because I know there has been too many questions about it, try to sum it up. So the microtoner is actually the type of ink you put in, inside your printer. It doesn't matter about um, uh, what kind of uh, microtoner. Microtoner, again, is micro, uh, a magnetic ink for check reader. Uh, so it's not the type printer, it's the type of ink. And we do recommend, because it is expensive, to have a separate printer for that. If you currently use that for EDF, it is going to be the same. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it, and that's what it's called. Uh, so hopefully that does help clarify this issue. So I'm going to do actually a couple of uh, more demonstration for manual and electronic. That's what you asked for earlier. So again, let's go to navigation, menu, your account receivable, payment, and online payments and deposit slip entry. Again, we go to add a new value. Here, if you re recall, we put S for standard, now for manual. Right here, if you look at it, it is M, but again, for shortcuts, you just put M here, you don't have to go to that menu, add. So here, if you notice, um, a major difference that now you could enter a deposit slip number and we could start that with um, two for manual just it has to be one right with one and let's say the CTS uh, uh, bank account number zero one nine the three uh, the following three digits are the location and the last three are the deposit number, right? The, last three. the first number identifies what type of a deposit it is. In this case, it's a one, remote is a two, um, ICL is an eight. If it's a check, if it's for your ZBA, it's a three, five, or a seven. The second, third, and fourth numbers are your CTS account numbers. The remaining six, are, six numbers are just sequential numbers. Okay, I stand corrected. So we do that. We have to confirm the deposit number. Will you please clarify if we can create our own deposit ID? I believe you can go into the regular AR deposit page and create generate your deposit 
your regular AR before you depart, do you create your deposit slip? But I will have to confirm that. It's a takeaway. We'll get back to you on that. All right. Having done that, now we will notice that the CTS bank account and the location is pre-populated for us. We go on to select the depository bank, the transport method, and then we go and enter the check amount and the number of checks and the total deposit. Now, if this was wrong, and I'll try to demonstrate quickly here, if we entered the wrong number and change to ready status, enter the date, the system will tell you that the total deposit does not match and will give you an error message. So you have to go back and correct that. Again, the system doesn't do it for you. You have to do it manually. And save, save. And now, as you can see, you have got a timestamp. It is ready, already in the system. You have a question? Currently, the process that we use for cash is is that it's sent to the bank. Is we use the manual deposit slip and we send a copy to SCO. Do we now process all cash with this new process? Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Currently, the process that we use for cash that is sent to the bank is we use manual deposit slips and we send a copy to SCO. Do we now process all cash with this new process? That's correct. You would do a standard deposit slip in the system. What does create regular deposit do? Is that the final step to complete the deposit? So the first part of the process is to get the physical cash, and then once you've collected the physical cash, you're going to create a deposit slip to bring all of that physical cash to the bank. And so let's say your department processes 10 checks and those sum up to $1,000, then you will enter in uh, $1,000 in 10 checks. However, you might want to account for those 10 checks in different ways. And what the next step of the process will be would be to create the regular deposit, which is not a deposit slip, after the money has been taken to the bank, and then do your AR uh, accounting inside of AR. And that would be where you actually do your remittances for those processes. Today you do that in EFITS, and then tomorrow you'll be doing that in, um, if you're an EDF department at least, and tomorrow you'll be doing that, I think all, the, all departments use EFITS actually, um, you'll be doing that directly in Fiscal as an AR deposit. So that is what the Create a Deposit Slip button does is it creates that uh, directly in Fiscal for you, and then it'll give you the deposit ID for you to then go account for your deposit. We use remote deposits. Are we going to use the deposit type E, and will the deposit type numbers be on the job aids? So on the, yes, you would use an E for your remote deposit type, and yes, as Yusar had stated earlier, there is a table um, attached to, to the back of the job aid that gives you a listing of the value of the different deposit types um, and the description on in what case scenario would you use that deposit type. What does the demand account field mean? The demand account. Okay, the d demand account is a number that STO uses to identify what bank it is. Will create regular deposit be available without creating a deposit slip as it is today in Fiscal? You can still create a regular deposit in Fiscal today um, outside of the deposit slip process. This is only for physical cash. When you take the cash to the bank, you need to account for that cash. However, if you need to do a variety of other transactions in AR, 
uh, you'll still be able to do those transactions. Will you please explain the difference between create regular deposit from deposit slip entry and AR regular deposit? Okay, so any deposit where there's money that you, that you need to deposit into the bank, you need to create a deposit slip. You can click on the right you can click on the Create Regular Deposit, and that will automatically generate your regular AR deposit. Then there are also, um, from the deposit slip, the regular AR deposit will be created through the batch process. However, for deposits that do not require a deposit slip that you're not taking to the bank, then you would go ahead and create your regular AR deposit. You can actually use the regular deposit page anytime you are trying to make adjustments or corrections to the already posted um, deposit or remittance. And by doing a $0 in the regular deposit page, it will also assign a deposit ID for that. And I can um, demonstrate that later today. Where can we find a list of the explanations for the deposit slip number? There is no list of explanations of the deposit slip number. I think we could work on putting something together for that. But what you were talking about earlier, how to start this uh, deposit number, like standard versus electronic. You said electronic starts with an eight, I guess. I think that's the question what they're asking about. If, if that's the question, um, yes, we can provide the departments with a listing of what the deposit slip would start with. We could probably add that as an addendum to the job aid. Uh, the job aid should be up before that, but we will update that, and we'll update these job aids as needed uh, as new information requests come in or as new information needs to be provided to the departments in a long-standing form. Is there a limit on the deposit amount or the item count? Item count cannot exceed 9,750. The total deposit cannot um, exceed, I believe it's $10,000, but I'll confirm that. What is the job aid number for the new remittance process that replaces EFITS? The new process uh, will be described to some degree in various other job aids that you see today. It's essentially what is done today in Fiscal, so there's no change to that. Um, but Lynette will go over a demonstration and show you live what that looks like, uh, because even though it sounds different than what you do today in Fiscal, it's not. Okay, back to the previous question about the total deposit amount. The total deposit amount can go up to 999999 Just a penny short of a million. <laughs> Where can we find the deposit type numbers? That's the same question, I guess. Okay, the deposit type numbers, I'm, I'm guessing the beginning number for each deposit type. We will create a list and, as Corey stated, we'll attach it um, to the job aid. Do we need to key the payments and payment entries into FISCAL at the same day when the deposit transmit to the bank slash STO? CDPH has remote deposit and ICL deposit. Some payments are entered in FISCAL manually and some payments are interfaced to FISCAL. Uh, well, that is correct me if I'm wrong. The date departments do not need to do that. The assumption is that the cash will be going into the bank and then the department's accounting department will account for these at some later time. When I can you provide specifics around timing? Um, specifics around timing for the departments to do their accounting for these deposit slips? It will depend, but um, as soon as they can, they should do the accounting entries for these deposits. Does the deposit slip information flow to the regular deposit screen? 
the de deposit slip number will be displayed on the regular air deposit screen and also the uh, total dollar amount will be displayed. I will um, run a test from end to end starting from the deposit slip entry page creating the regular deposit page in my demonstration later. What are the differences between standard deposit and remote deposit? A standard deposit is just a regular deposit. It replaces the manual deposit slip. You're still going to take that deposit physically to the bank or send it to the bank via courier. Um, a remote deposit is an electronic. You electronically um, scan your, your checks and send it to the bank. What deposit type do we use for paper deposit that could not be submitted electronically? Failed check 21. If it's a failed check 21, I'm guessing that they're talking ITL or remote. Um, if you can't electronically send that deposit to the bank and you need to physically take that deposit to the bank, um, as long as you're not a, a pre-sort department, I would recommend that you create um, a E remote deposit slip. Um, well, you already created your deposit slip, so if you can't push it, you just use that deposit slip to take it to the bank. And probably use a standard to enter the information, standard slip. Yeah. They've already created that deposit slip that they're going to electronically send that deposit that they're going to electronically send to the bank so they can use that deposit. They already accounted for it. Okay. okay. Are you going to de show a demonstration for the electronic deposit slip process? And can you show us how to edit a deposit after status has been changed to ready? Okay. okay we can do that. Are there any more questions? Okay. So we'll do that once we're done with the questions. Can you clarify what is the limit per deposit? Was it 10,000 or just short of a million? Just a penny short of a 1 million. What if departments have deposits over a million? Um, we recommend that you split that deposit into. EDF was able to do way more. We deposit more than a million frequently. In, in EDF or EFT? EDF, I don't believe so, but I'll clarify that and get back to you. Do we have to create a separate deposit slip for the difference if it's more than a million? I recommend that, yes. So we are starting to be a little short on time, and we do want to show you the SEO aspects. Uh, so we're going to have to do a takeaway on the rest of the questions. Yasara is going to quickly show how to do a remote deposit, and then we'll have Lynette come up for uh, the demonstration about how to do EFITs. Don't worry. If you have questions here, you can ask them in uh, the Q&A. Uh, please preface them about, you know, say something at the beginning, say four deposit slips, so that we know there are four deposit slips. And then you can also always ask questions at Fiscal CMO uh, and the Fiscal CMO mailbox. So that's fiscal.cmo.fiscal at fiscal.ca.gov. So go ahead, sir. All right, so going back to deposit slip entry, go to the main page, and if we go to add a new value, magnifying glass, for remote, it's the letter E. Add, and here as you notice, the only fields we have is for check. Again, all the information here, uh, the fields for the deposit slip number is them, currency them, likewise for coin, you go on to the checks, you enter the amount, uh, check count, let's say it's um, 50 checks, again, total amount is 10,000, and 
we change the status into ready and date. And after that, we just save it. And that's all it is. Now, there was a question. I'm going to get back to it quickly. Let's say we need to adjust this. It's not 3 o'clock yet. It hasn't been run. You go back to the status. You look up this deposit. And you go back. You change it into draft. You can see now you could edit the field. Let's say we're going to make uh, the amount different. It's 11,000 now. So we adjust that. And now we change the status back into ready. And save again. All right, thank you, Fusar. We're now going to have Lynette come up. However, I wanted to give uh, Bobby, let me know that she had a correction. I think she misstated the amount for uh, the maximum deposit. For this account, it's one dollar or one penny short of a billion, not a million. Yeah. Uh, I think STO is well aware that some departments have uh, deposits that are much larger than a million regularly, and we're not trying, and STO is not trying to add additional work for departments. So it should be similar to EDF. Uh, one penny short of a billion. All right, thank you. Thank you, Yusar. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have Lynette come up. And then also, thank you, Bobby. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynette Andres from SEO Fiscal. And I am here to show you how remittances and payments will be entered in Fiscal, which is a change from what you normally do today um, in legacy using EFIT. So what I'll do is we actually uh, prepared um, some scenarios here that normally you would go over or you would you would normally encounter our process on a daily basis. So, okay. I will start from create uh, creating the deposit um, ID using the deposit slip entry page so I could show end to end. So, oh, yeah. So I need to go back because um, I need to use standard deposit type in order to run my process. Okay. Uh, to show you guys the continuity here, Lynette is currently entering in a deposit entry or deposit slip entry using a standard type because that is the most common. Um, just as a representative example, the process doesn't change for each of the different types. Uh, so what you're seeing now is just a, a Lynette is quickly going through the process to enter a standard deposit slip uh, with some numbers that she's you know kind of prepared for you guys to do your remittance information on um, to record the payment entry. Uh, so that is the accounting side of things. So you'll see that she has set her CTS account, uh, entered her deposit slip to information. I use the date of. So yesterday's date in order for me to show you a correction later, which of course will not happen the same day. So what you need to look for here is to is the deposit slip number that is assigned after creating the deposit slip. You'll have to take that a note of that because you'll be needing that for later. So she sees the, the deposit slip number where, uh, can you show them where? The deposit slip number is up here. That's what you need to take note of. Once you have that, you can now click the Create Regular Deposit in order to give you the deposit ID, which is, we see here, a 6122. Take note of that as well. And so you guys understand um, the... Clicking the, as we said earlier, clicking the create a deposit or clicking the create a regular deposit finalizes the deposit slip. So you'll no longer be able to make updates. You'll see that everything has been grayed out. 
This is the same thing that will happen at the batch at 3 p.m. Uh, we typically recommend you just wait until the 3 p.m. batch, but if you need to do the accounting entries at the same time like we're showing you today, that button is available for you. And then the deposit ID field updated. Okay. Now you will have to go to accounts receivable, payments, online payments to get to the regular deposit page where you will see that the deposit ID was, create, uh, was created for this particular transaction. And so those of you who are familiar with Fiscal as an accountant, you'll see that this is the typical process you'll do to find a deposit that's already been made. You'll find the existing value, enter the deposit unit and deposit ID, and click search. Now we will see that some of the values were inherited from the deposit slip entry page. You see that the accounting date was inherited October 2nd. The bank code will be state. The bank account, checking account was inherited, including the bank deposit number as well as the deposit type. Even the amount was inherited. The only thing that you will have to enter is the number of payments related to this deposit. So I will enter one, but if you have more than one payment, Related to the deposit, you can enter that on the count. If you have two, enter two. If you have three payments related to the deposit, enter three. Uh, quickly, Lynette, you said earlier to take note of the deposit slip number. Is that the deposit slip number there? That it, yes, that is correct. Because I took note of it, 12620014. I will be needing that later when I demonstrate the correction or adjustment to this deposit. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And then you will go to the Payments tab. And you, here you will enter your payment information. First, you'll enter a payment ID. The payment ID is a free form field, but it's a required field. And you can enter however your department is tracking your payments. You'll enter the, the same amount because I only have one payment related to this deposit. I will use the full amount of $3.21. So my deposit and my payment will balance. Let us assume in this particular scenario that this is deposit is not tied to any open item or any AR item. So I'll click on direct journal or journal directly in order to process. That's all you need to enter and then click save. And, and then Lynette, mm -hmm. uh, so what you're currently doing, this is what you would do in EFITS today? That is correct. We are, we are doing the TC-47. This is equivalent to the TC-47 in that you actually do in EFITS. This is where you're remitting, applying the payments to the deposit that was made. And so um, departments, they currently do this today to... I mean, from my understanding, do departments do this today to mirror what they do in EFITS? That is correct. Departments will um, do this, enter these information that they normally enter in legacy EFITS and do it in fiscal. And so do you think that's going to save departments time? That is correct. Another um, good thing about this is this is also real time. So if you're making, let's say, corrections, you enter, um, you enter this today. And then tomorrow, if you um, realize that you made a mistake, instead of sending paper form to correct, which normally would take from mailing time, with mailing time and everything, would normally take up to two weeks. But this, because uh, you can do online, you can um, send your corrections online, and there will be less time to process the correction. Now I will click on Apply Payment in order for me now to enter the accounting entries. And this will take me to the account, Create Accounting Entries page. I will pull this um, um, icon here to show all the columns so it will be easier for me to enter my information. This is what we call the distribution line. And sure most of you are familiar. This is where you enter all the chart field values for your direct journal uh, payment. 
and then Lynette for mm -hmm. the user line or the distribution line. Um, are these values the same as they was as they would enter today? That is correct. Is this where you will see in EPEX where you have like not, I think believe ninety nine distribution lines in EPEX? This you can create more. And will this be using the Fiscal UCM? That is correct. I'll enter general fund in that link here. I will use a revenue account. You can use your lookup button here. And since we're doing revenue, we're not able to enter the program. I will save it. And I will click on this lightning bolt to create the cash account. Uh, Lynette, just a quick question about the user line. Um, is there any requirements from SEO for that user line? That for, is, for which fields need to be entered for these? That is correct. So um, we need to enter the correct information or the account chart, um, the chart of account values um, that, let's say, like I mentioned, for let's say you're entering um, um, an expenditure item, you'll have to fill out all the information that's needed for an expenditure item, like the ref, the fund, the enactment year, the account should be a five series account, or an expenditure account, you have to have the alt account, or sometimes it pre-populates it. You'll have to enter a program, it has um, a scheduled program and, and all that. Okay, so you. SEO will actually, uh, especially when you're doing corrections, when SEO reviews this, this has to be correct. Otherwise, it will be sent back to the departments for correction. Is there anybody to help departments to guide them, um, maybe from DAF or SEO? Yes. There will always be help. If they need help, they can always um, contact, like, um, help uh, Department of Finance or whoever their liaison is or their analyst to be able to help them. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I'll now click the lightning bolt to show the cash accounting entries. And the field will be grayed out. So I won't be able to change it. And I'll, I will now click the complete checkbox here to show that I've completed my process and then save it. Is that it? Is that all there is to a TC-47, what departments do in EFITS today? Um, there's actually different scenarios that we can go through um, if time permits. This is a standard scenario for TC-47. This is just basic, simple, um, um, direct. Um, and this is what they normally do today. Like when they uh, remit money, they remit it to the revenue. But we, they can also do, um, they can also do process remittance against reimbursement or expenditure, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that we can show if time permits. Here. And this page looks new. Uh, what is it? This page is um, equivalent to the page that you send right now using the CA 504 form where this is just, or any, any other form requiring uh, certification. This is the direct journal certification is just pretty much saying that I, you are uh, doing this under penalty of perjury, that what you're, you're honest, you're being honest, and that the, the transactions or the values that are actually uh, um, using for your transactions is correct and uh, in compliance with whatever legal authority you're citing. So, so this is saying as long as you're honest and correct about your information, you should be good? Yes. So you'll enter your email address here, um, you as the processor, and then your phone number. So that way, if um, SEO or whoever has questions regarding the transactions that you created should be able to contact you for more information, like if they need more details and then click on Certify under penalty of perjury, and then click OK. 
Now this um, is a regular remittance and will not work flow to SEO. There are other uh, scenarios where uh, it will require SEO's approval, like I mentioned, if you're trying to correct um, a previous PC47 um, remittance, it will workflow to SEO. Or let's say you are trying to cross GLBU, you do a PC47 or remittance crossing GLBUs, it will also workflow to SEO. We have discussed this uh, when we did the workshop last month. And um, if you need like a refresher, uh, everything is out there um, to be reviewed for them to know which ones will workflow and will not workflow to SEO. And I believe we also sent um, a communication to the department of what to look for when you're doing remittances. Um, when that, so have you finished the regular TC47? Yes, that's correct. I'm just running the budget check now to make sure that it is a valid uh, transaction. Normally, it will fail budget status. You'll see an um, error here. If um, for some reason there's no budget uh, or something is wrong with the chart field that you're using and it's not in compliance with the chart of accounts or any combo edits that's set up in the general ledger, so since we see that it is valid status, then we're good to go. This is how you complete a TC-47, a basic TC-47 remittance in Fiscal. Okay. Now we've mentioned... Um, that, you know, at this time, I would like to open up some questions around the basic TC-47. I don't know. It sounds like there's a lot of questions around this process. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them. Um, sure. But we'll, we'll see. We'll do what we can. How do we record a deposit in the uncleared collection for remitt remitting at a later date? Okay. What you will do is you will go to the regular deposit page and then enter the deposit there. And when you go apply the payments and create the accounting entries, you oh, I will have to show it. It, it sounds like on this page here, you'll just enter in the uncleared collections account yes. where she entered her account. Yes. What you will do is instead of a state fund, okay, this is a state fund, right? On the fund uh, um, chart field, you will enter your checking account number, which is a nine-digit um, account number, starting with, let's say, for this one, my checking account is 262 for BU5175. So you'll see in the fund, you'll enter 00000262, the nine digits. And then the difference will be, instead of a four series here on the account, you will enter the 2090100 um, account for uncleared collection. Jeffrey here will assist us in some of the questions um, if we have, um, anymore, it's something that I need help with. Okay. Thank you. We currently do not remit uncleared collections. Do all deposits need to be remitted with this new process? All deposits should be remitted using this new process. Uh, however, you'll follow your current process with the values entry. It's, there's no specific process because every department is different. Um, so we can't give you, we can give you guidance around, around general areas for your accounting, but because every department is different, all of your accounting will be different, and you'll just do what you do today. Will there be any off-site or on-site training for this? The training should be the same as you've gotten for Fiscal. Um, we could work through Fiscal CMO or Fiscal FSE uh, to see if you can get additional training for your support labs that those have been ongoing and they'll continue to be ongoing. What role in Fiscal do you need to do this cash remittance? So the first role you'll need in Fiscal is the deposit processor for the screen we did prior. Deposit however, slip entry page. Yep, however, we assume that most of those people will be just uh, key entry folks who are just doing it to enter the information. However, for the accounting part of it, you'll need your accountants to have the AR payment processor role and in order to do the uh, approval, this stage where you certify under penalty of perjury and enter in your distribution line, you'll need your BIAR approver. 
Any direct journal certification for CTS transaction? On this particular uh, payment page, every entry will require certification. Does this mean that deposits are remitted automatically in real time through the deposit entry process and that it will eliminate the separate process of remittance EFITs? Yes. Will the email address and phone number default or need to be entered for each? Can we have hundreds per day and will slow down deposits if and will this slow down deposits if this has to be entered for each? It has to be entered for each um, payment. We can look through the EIP process if there's any way for that to be enhanced. We have one of the enterprise funds won't be able to be remitted through FISCAL. Who should we contact to address our concern? Can you repeat the question? We have one of the enterprise funds that won't be able to be remitted through FISCAL. Who should we contact to address this concern? If those are not currently remitted through the TC 47 EFITS process, perhaps they follow the TC 30 process, that'll stay consistent where you'll still be sending your admittance advice form if it's being remitted directly to the state treasury. Can we do more than one entry for separated ENY? Yes. Regarding deposit slip, when a deposit number is generated, we still can adjust the amount and item count before 3 p.m. on the same day and stay with the same deposit number. Can you verify this? As long as you don't quickly create a regular deposit, the and it's, the deposit slip can be edited until um, a deposit ID is assigned to it. It should be at the batch 3 p.m. or if you click the regular or create a regular deposit button. Is that correct, Jeffrey? Correct. It looks like we have to. It looks like we have to certify every payment that is a direct journal. Is that correct? Yes. We are expecting a check in the amount of $29 million. What are we going to do? If this has to do with the cutover process, then we can get into that a little bit later. Um, but essentially, you can either wait until Monday and do it in Fiscal directly, or you can do it in EDF today and do it through EFETS today, depending on what time your timing is there. Um, I would recommend you wait if you can. And if you can't, then you can follow the if you happen to get this on Friday, you can follow some of the procedures while we're later. What happens when we have remitted the money and then we receive a dishonor check or we have a refund we need to process? Uh, these, these job aids are currently on the fiscal website. They're, they're available for you. Um, however, we identified as part of this process that they needed to be updated, so they were taken down. Uh, departments will be notified when a full process is there because that is a fairly complicated situation uh, of any job aids. We're going to provide a job aid in that situation. When uncleared money has been identified for remittance, will a deposit correction go through the SEO workflow and what backup will SEO want to see? Actually, if um, they're able to identify, it will still be considered as a TC47 remittance, but it will be processed as a $0 on the regular deposit page, moving the money from the uncleared collection account to the state fund. And then it will not workflow to SEO. And that might be a good time for us to show a demonstration of that, because I believe that, and that you have prepared a demonstration. Yes. Of, uh, you can go through the <laughs> correction demonstrations you already prepared. OK. So I will actually show you two corrections now, um, unless we do prefer to do the TC35 correction later. I, I can show it real quick. Yes. So what I'll do is since uh, I told you that I will do the end-to-end -end process from creating the uh, transaction from the deposit slip entry page, creating the regular deposit for the payments and remittances, I will now show you how to correct 
um, or make corrections um, using a zero dollar <coughs> transaction, which is an answer to your question earlier. So we'll go to the same page, accounts receivable payments, online payments, and the regular deposit. I sh told you earlier to make sure that um, to take note of the deposit ID as well as the deposit slip number, um, what you created earlier. So, so, so Lynette, the next demonstration for Lynette seems like it's going to be taking the deposit slip that she just made and then doing a correction to it. That's correct. So this is a, <coughs> a deposit slip that she entered originally and then she did the accounting entries for and then now it seems like she's doing a correction for it. I think this is currently called a TC35. TC35. Uh, which would be a paper form that you send into STO. You'll no longer have, or not SCO, SCO. but SCO. Uh, you'll no longer have to send in that paper form to SCO. You can follow the process that Lynette is currently doing where she fills in her accounting information as a, um, on the, is this a new AR deposit or? Is this a new AR deposit yes, that I am creating? She created the new error deposit, and then she wrote down the deposit slip number earlier, and then now she's entering that deposit slip number um, to notify the SEO that this is a correction to that deposit slip. Okay. So because this is a new regular deposit um, that I'm creating for the $0 correction to the original TC47 that I just created earlier, which is I will be correcting deposit ID 6122. So my accounting date now that I'm using is at least the following day. The bank code is still state. I entered bank account 0000, because every any time you're making corrections from state to state fund, you will have to use bank account 0000 instead of using your own checking account. The only time that you will use your own checking account is if you are creating something related to your CTS fund. I use the same deposit type. and here is where I, we show that you will need to enter the bank deposit slip number on this chart field bank deposit number, okay? Your total control amount will be zero because this particular type of um, correction is only adjusting between, I will be adjusting between, um, within the same fund, but only um, different account. So I'll put a zero dollar here, and the count should be, always be two, because two, because you'll create two payment sequences. Payment sequence one will be the reversal of the original TC47 that was entered, and payment sequence two will be the correction to where the money should go. And then just to reiterate, the reason this is called a zero dollar deposit is because the control value there, the control total amount there is zero. And so as long as your payment sequences add up or net to zero, you can use any amount. So if you have, uh, a, let's say you have three and you have a $10, uh, let's say it's a debit, and then you have two $5 credits that nets to zero, and then you can use that to move your accounting entries around um, to make corrections or adjustments. Then I'll go to the payments tab once again. What I will use here, I forgot to tell you that you also need to take note of the payment ID that you used originally um, on the, when you created your TC47. And so it sounds like for your payment ID values, you'll use what you currently do today. Right. Um, but from my understanding, if you're doing a reversal and a correction, uh, SCO will now want you to put in an underscore. R. In this case, it's going to be the R. Mm -hmm to denote that it's the reversal entry. Now enter a credit for the full amount if you're correcting a full amount. By the way, you can also correct partial amount from that original deposit. But in this scenario, I will correct the full amount. So I'll enter a credit, 3.21. I'll click on journal directly because we processed journal directly earlier. And then I'll add another line, and I'll click View All in order to also create at the same time the second payment sequence. I'll scroll down, 
to enter this value. So when you click view all, you can see them at the same time where the first one is in the first one uh, that you would see on the screen. And then if you scroll down, you would see the second one. You can do that if it's your preference, if it's preference. And then I also entered the same payment ID, but it's underscore C for the correction. And then I'll enter a positive amount in order to balance. And then click on journal directly, checkbox, because it's all related to direct journal. And then I will save it. And then Lynette, if you need multiple payment for the second C, would you do just also do C or would you do C2? Um, Jeffrey, have you tried multiple payments? Usually you would just do one payment because you're correct in the distribution line, all the changes that you need. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And then once you're done, you see that you're uh, assigned a deposit ID, which is separate from the original deposit ID that you're trying to correct. So enter that deposit ID or take note of it. And then click on Apply Payment link to apply the accounting entries. I will then again click this icon here. So I was directed to sequence payment sequence one page because I'll have to do it one at a time. Payment sequence one. This is where I'll enter the reversal of the transaction, the original transaction. Then I'll enter the exact values used in the original TC47 remittance that I am reversing. So it sounds like if you did a, if you want to correct a value, you take whichever you put in the first time and you would mirror that. And instead of doing, if you did a credit or debit, you would just do the opposite. So the only difference between the reversal entry would just be that you're actually taking the money out and then uh, making the sign negative. That's correct. So that's what I entered earlier. I'll click on the lightning bolt to show the cash entries. And I'll click complete. So that completes the first payment. Mm -hmm. And then I'll save it. It'll ask me to say, um, that there will be a message pop-up that says deposit is not routed for approval and that I need to certify and submit for approval. And I'll have to certify. Before I click certify, I can enter the legal authority. When you're correcting, there is a set of instructions from um, state controller's office that they would want to see when they're reviewing your um, corrections. And um, Right now, this is the to correct to reverse. There should be some guidance coming out from SEO about what the kind of information that they would expect here for these kinds of corrections. Um, you'll need to enter and follow those specifications for the legal lines here, as well as the note section so that your correction can be approved efficiently by the SEO. Um, this way, they, don't, they have all the information up front. Uh, this, this whole process should greatly increase the efficiency that you see your correction updates. Like we were saying earlier, more build time rather than having to send in a paper form. The, the types of supporting information will be very similar to what you currently put and include with your paper form. Uh, so don't expect it to be a, a, big, a big difference. It's just a matter of improving efficiencies and getting rid of paper in your interactions with the controller's office. Do you have anything to add to that, Jeffrey? Uh, no, I don't. Except that you can notice that there's a link for attachment, so that's where you attach any supporting documents for this correction. I entered CR um, dollar sign XXXX because after the transaction, it will be interface and it will be assigned the document ID CR, and then there's um, a sequential number to be assigned, but because we did not run the interface, we don't really need to see that because that is being done through batch process. That's why I just entered XXX. Now what state controllers want to see is this standard format when you are reversing um, 
your um, original transaction. So REV, CR, dollar sign, and then the sequential number for your document ID, and then the date of the original transaction. So after entering those information, I'll now need to certify. And like I said earlier, you'll, this is where you'll enter your email address, your phone number. And when that it looks like that email address saved. Yes. So it does sound like it's going this to is save. A, this is a default. You'll have to enter your information here. I can enter my information here to show you who, who to contact and then click on certify. If you're certifying under penalty of perjury that your transaction is true and and in compliance with your legal authority or your reason for requesting this. Now, in, instead of submitting for approval for sequence one, I will complete sequence two before submitting for approval in order for it for the process to be complete. So now return to search. And then, well, okay. well, Lynette, well, Lynette finishes her sequence for two. Um, Jeffrey. It sounds like the sequences need to be done separate AR deposits. Is that how it occurs today? Correct. You need to do both sequence, submit both sequence at the same time. This is where I'm now entering the values that it should have went to. So because we're doing a TC35, which is within the same fund, I'm using entering the same fund 0001 and same enactment here. And I am, because I am only changing the account. So this is a $0 correction to move money from one account to the, other, to account. the other account. And then um, in reference to an earlier comment about you know, people entering hundreds or dozens or many of these deposits every day, that sounds like, and it looks like based on the demo, that the information about the certification will pop up from the user profile. Um, I have to just discuss this with Jeffrey and he confirmed it, and you guys can see that uh, it's already available for you so you can update your user profile um, and speed up the process a little bit as you enter many of these transactions. You'll just get, get another pop-up to just remind you that you need to certify. And the legal authority and reason for request will be inherited on the payment, onto the payment sequence too. Now you need to enter a different note to approve her for what you're correcting. So what SEO wants is to, this is actually what you currently do when you're sending uh, paper um, corrections in paper form. So nothing is changing to the notes. And put the date of the original transaction. Once you're done, you can click certify. And like we said, you need to certify for all your transactions and all your payments. No matter if you are, if no matter if it, this will work flow to SEO or not. Click certify. After you click certify, you can now submit to SEO for approval. Once you click submit for approval, it will go to um, the approver one, SEO approver one's work list. So I'll now have to sign out. Okay. okay, I don't need to show that. So this should be the end of the steps for a correction that you'll need to do. If Lynette, if there, if SEO approves it, is there anything else that the department would need to do at this point? Yeah, so if F SEO approves it, the department will have to go back to the payments screen, click direct journal payments, and modify accounting entry. So now you need to run the budget check for each of the payment sequence. So is there any support, um, the maybe reports to help departments manage their you know, payments that are in approvals that are waiting for SEO approval? There are queries that they can use. There's also the cash receipt report that they could um, use to 
um, review all these payments. There is a field where they can show, I'm not sure if I have access to it here. Um, I don't, oh, yes, to review all the payments. We'll go to review payments, review payments, and all payments. And it seems like this is all available in Fiscal today. Yeah, that's correct. In Fiscal, um, online, whether online or also report form. So um, I can show you what's available uh, for 5175 for all payments. I'll pick, a, I'll pick one here, and it'll show you the payment that was made back on August 31st with that payment ID, the um, the journal ID assigned by General Ledger that it got posted and um, and processed. Okay. So. Well, thank you. So it sounds like this is a good time for us. So that that seems like it was the end of the correction entry, uh, showing what was that a TC thirty five? A TC thirty five, which is um, correction within the same fund. Mm -hmm. A TC thirty eight is will be what you normally do when you're correcting between funds, different funds. Okay. But, and then um, for departments that there is a job aid that uh, Lynette and the uh, FCO team at Fiscal, the Fiscal team has created for you guys to, you know, outline the areas that will will workflow to SCO for approval. Uh, the job aid is job aid 391. Uh, departments will be notified that that job aid is available at the same time when they're notified that the created deposit slip is available. Uh, they're kind of a pair, this is the second part of it. When Once you create your deposit and do your, do your cash deposit to the bank, you'll also need to then remit that money um, do you, in, in, uh, supply your payments to that money in Fiscal. Uh, so this is the process that you do today in Fiscal. It's being enhanced by um, combining that with what you do outside of Fiscal, you know, sending paper forms to SEO or using EFITs. Um, and then directly everything now is in Fiscal, which should overall uh, improve the user experience once you know, we know it's going to be a, an effort to get used to it, but um, at the end of the day, we think it's going to be a positive value for departments. Um, so I think this is a good time for us to open up for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Regarding deposits again, who can be able to adjust or avoid a deposit slip when it was generated? With EDF, a department can set up different roles. An example, one can make a deposit slip, but only others with authorization can avoid or adjust. So within the department, there's only one role now, deposit slip processor, and that will have to be managed by a department or by department users. Um, the STO is uh, not with us anymore. They're, they have uh, some other priorities, so we can't give you more information around deposit slip questions now. Um, can we focus the questions on the SCO related things? For all deposits of questions, we're still going to have to get back to you on many of them if we haven't answered them. Where can we get the CRE number? Is it generated right away? It will be generated as soon as it's interfaced from fiscal to legacy. So it's basically on the bank statement. Once can both sequence numbers be submitted at once and only do one certification? No, you have to certify each separate payment sequence. Is it required under the payment ID should be underscore C? That is correct. That is what SEO would want to see uh, in order for them to identify which um, sequence is being corrected and which values are being corrected and for easier tracking. And it's also good for the departments to track the, the payments that they've corrected. And so that's an underscore R for the reversal, reversal. entry and then an underscore C for that's the correcting correct. entry. Yes. I believe that there should be some communication coming out from SEO um, outlining that policy a little bit better for departments. That is correct. We record ARO journals, payroll ARs, using bank account 0000. Will this workflow to SEO now? If it's um, payroll and if it's um, anything that um, you're correcting or adjusting that from state fund to state fund or within 
you know, between state funds, it will, it will workflow to SEO. Once it is approved by SEO, does Fiscal run automated process to budget check it? After, uh, can you repeat the question? Once it is approved by SEO, does Fiscal run automated process to budget check it? Actually, the departments will have to go in the modify accounting entries page, which I was trying to show earlier, and then click the the budget check icon to run the budget check. How can we do a bank rec if the deposit ID isn't the same ID as the deposit number? Currently, we're using the deposit number in the deposit ID field. We'll need to get back to you in regards to that. However, there's a request to change that to show the deposit number instead of deposit ID. Will ZBA trans transactions create deposit slips in FISCAL automatically? Will the RIA ZBA transactions create a negative deposit slip transaction? That's correct. The system will automatically create the ZBA deposits and addition will automatically create the negative RIA deposit within the system. Will those be approved automatically? Those deposit slips will automatically be created. However, departments need to complete the rest by going into the AR regular deposit and complete those transactions. Are all these job aids going to be available before Monday so we have time to work with staff on each of these processes? Uh, the job aid should be available as soon as we can. Uh, there was a slight delay with the new website. Um, I was hoping that they would be available this morning uh, for us to get that communication to you, but we'll have to work with our comms unit and our technical team for the website to make sure that they're up as soon as possible, hoping to get that up, like I said, as soon as possible. There was a question in regards to payroll AR. There's some job aid on the website in regards to payroll AR. If you could just take a look at the job aid and I'll tell you how to process those payroll ARs. And I think that's currently existing process. Is there's no change to that process is what you do today. So that, that job aid is the same job aid you've been using. We have remote locations that process deposits with manual deposit slips. For these deposit slips to be entered into FISCAL, could we have them send those to deposit slips to HQ and post those items in FISCAL, or do they need FISCAL roles established? They would, uh, from the STO, we would need to give you, a, you know, an STO SME to answer the question. But from my understanding, uh, they, people who are validated to use the manual deposit slips and send this to HQ would not need roles. They would just fill out the deposit slips like they do today. And instead of sending it to STO, they would send it to their HQ. And the people at HQ would need the role to then enter that information directly rather than having the STO do that. So th those folks at HQ would need that role. And then the, those folks at HQ could then process the accounting entries like Lynette has been showing us or to do the uh, payments and remittances like you wouldn't need this today. What is the CR number and is it automatically assigned in fiscal? That is correct. CR dollar and then sequential number. So it's basically the remittance number. In EFIS, you get R followed by some number. So in fiscal, we have CR dollar sign. I believe in the bank statement, it'll have a dollar sign on it. Yes. What is SEO's turnaround for review all deposit transactions? That will depend on the volume of work that they have, but um, they would normally um, attend to the corrections or re review as soon as they can. And Lynette, it sounds like there's not going to be very much change from how they do it today. That is correct. The only um, thing that will change is the turnaround time for mailing, which you don't need to mail it anymore, which is good news. So no matter what, it seems like it'll at least be faster than today. Where can we find the CRE number when it is generated? Do you want to show them very quickly? The CR number is generated when the interface file is created from fiscal to legacy. 
Then when legacy creates the bank statement, it will contain the CR dollar sign. And then that particular bank statement is interfaced into Fiscal, and that will appear on Fiscal bank statement. It doesn't show on the payment, so it'll be on the bank statement. You'll need to be you need to go into your bank statement page in Fiscal and then read it there. For deposits to be applied against employee AR, will we still be required to fill out and submit STD 995A to PPSD? Uh, yes, that's still the same. Uh, payroll interface uh, is not implemented during this particular release. It will be part of a future release. So it sounds like there's no change to what you do today. You'll still need to send in that paper form. The SCOSTO release has been put into several different milestones and several different releases so that we can provide small incremental updates. And the goal is to get rid of all paper and make sure SCO is completely in fiscal. Um, so that'll have to happen. I believe that's at a later release. How would we process a refund for overpayment or correction on an accounts receivable item? Uh, we listed this in the process updates earlier. Uh, we'll also have that listed in the communication. There's three options for you. Annette? Yes. The same, like the or for replenishment or the or for replenishment claim, or you can uh, the department can cut a check. And then um, it, as soon as and then they can, the the voucher will have to rep, um, replenish their checking account, and then they can also short their next remittance. Those are the three options we mentioned earlier. Do we enter federal fund remittance into FSC, or do we still send the remittance to STO to record? Federal remittance. Um, Yes, it will be recorded still. Uh, it, it will be an inbound interface and nothing will change. Just to, for clarity, um, departments will still send their paper remittance form to the STO and then the STO will enter that information for you and then they'll send that to SCO who will enter it into your legacy information that will interface uh, over from SCO legacy into Fiscal so you don't need to do anything there. However, if it's related to an item, you will, the departments will need to go to the AR item field or AR item page to enter the a RA number on the item ID field and, the, uh, and then enter an INV or select INV for entry type and uh, select federal when they run that process in order for it to close the the item when the interface is run. Yeah, we uh, reviewed some of that information earlier at the Department Change Impact Workshop. Uh, I'll show you guys where that presentation is after the demonstration. Will we receive notification to budget check? You will have to go into the Modify Accounting Entries page in order to budget check. It sounds like you'll have to be looking at your reports daily. Um, to see if anything hasn't been budget checked yet, and then once they've been approved, go in there and budget check them manually. So I think we're actually coming up, we're pretty close on time right now. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions here. Uh, in the past, we have not seen as many questions, so it's good. Um, it sounds like we could have used a little bit of a longer session, but we've only scheduled the session today for two hours. Uh, so I want to thank all departments for coming. I'm going to show you a little quickly uh, what it looks like to get additional information from. I'll switch over. All right, so this is the demo. All right, so I'm going to quickly go into and go to the new Fiscal website. So it's just www.fiscal.ca.gov.
So this is the new website. Hopefully you guys can come and spend some time checking it out. Uh, down here you'll see all of the job aids. You can click there. And this is where you'll be able to search for your job aids. And so I think someone mentioned an ARO job aid. Uh, so there's some payroll job aids here. If you type payroll, uh, you can search for job aids there. What we're looking for is the 391. This is the job aid. Oh, it seems like it is available on the website now. That's good. It wasn't available earlier. So this is the SEO approval of AR deposits and remittances. This job aid is the one we're describing where it will cover all of the scenarios that will workflow to SEO. And then this is 389 is the job aid for creating a standard deposit slip. This is the one that at the back has a table for all of your deposit types. We highly recommend everybody go in there. It's available right now for you to download and review. Um, and then if you have any questions on those, please send those to the Fiscal CMO mailbox. And we'll see if we can get back to you before we go live because we know this is a big issue, or a big, not issue, but a big area for people and big impact for departments. So those are there. And then if you go into library resources, you'll see that we have a page here for you, the SEO SEO integrated solution. And then right here, we've got uh, the general resources and the workshops. So this is the workshop I was mentioning earlier will be outlined the TC30 or the direct remittance to state treasury process. Um, it includes some information about including federal there, making sure you have your RA number there so that the TC30 is automatically close out your open items if you have them. Um, the job aid around uh, 391 has some information there if you're trying to do reclassification to help you with your reclassification. Uh, it's all there. We've got the infographic we showed you earlier. Um, and then if we do upload this presentation, it's not very much in the presentation, but we would upload it here uh, for you guys. And then we also got your MDW, um, which we will be uploading with the next milestone releases. We should be closing out most of the MDW items now for the milestone to release this week as we go live. Uh, so we'll get the updated items there for the uh, milestone three release one and release two. So let's go back to the presentation. That was the demo portion. And then I just went over the resources page. So I just wanted to end today with some quick cutover logistics. So just as a reminder for everybody, the STO EDF uh, access for all fiscal departments will change to view only access after 2.30 p.m. All deposits should be in ready status by 2.30 p.m. in the EDF, with only the exceptions being supplemental and foreign checks sent to banks on a collection basis. So you can keep using those as you do. Um, for and so, like I said, I would either recommend if you're going to do a deposit that you wait till next week. That would be the most ideal uh, for this to go live. Or if you want to make sure it's entered into EDF beforehand, you do so before 2:30 p.m. And at the same time, you also, you know, SEO is giving uh, you an extra hour and a half after you do your deposits to do your remittances for those deposits. If you still want to do those in EFIT, um, if you want to, if you like the new system. Or if you like doing a drop in Fisca, you can wait till next week as well uh, for when we officially go live. Just need to let you know all catch up deposits made through EDF prior to cutover and the related payments or remittances for those deposits should be entered in Fiscal. So if you have anything after 4 p.m. that you haven't done yet, you'll want to enter those in Fiscal uh, on Monday. So we'll get your no go live decision. We'll have all that information saying where, because I'm, you know, we're pretty confident that we're going live this weekend. Uh, We'll get that information after the final decision by the steering committee is made um, tomorrow, and then you'll get you'll get this cutover information again as a communication, letting everyone know that we are going live and what the fiscal and availability windows will be. And then that'll be available for you as soon as you gain access to fiscal Monday morning. All right, so I think we're good here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to close our webcast session. I hope you guys liked it. We're going to continue to do these. It seems like there's some pretty good responses. And especially, we will probably extend the time to three hours to uh, give you more time to get access to this needs to answer your questions directly in a timely manner. But if you have any questions that ha you have still haven't been answered yet, uh, we are. you can go to the FISCAL website for more information, as I showed you, or you can email the FISCAL project team at fiscal.cmo at fiscal.ca.gov. We are going to review the uh, items that have been, the questions that have been asked today, and we're going to create an FAQ and kind of collect common questions together 
in a way that answered everyone's questions. And we'll also put up that FAQ on the resources page. So we'll send you an email of some sort. Or uh, once you go live, I recommend just going to the resources page and looking for those FAQ questions um, that, are, that would be available for you. All right, thank you, everybody.